Okay, well, good evening. Uh, my name is Libby Sellers, and in my role as moderator for tonight's panel discussion, I wish to welcome you to the RIBA. Um, we're here to celebrate and muse upon um, the life and work of the Irish-born architect and designer, Max Clendinning. Yes. Um, who together with his lifelong uh, partner, the set designer, Ralph Adron, who's with us tonight, thank you, um, captured the architecture and interior zeitgeist of the late 20th century. It's a fitting venue for tonight's talk, the RIBA, as not only did Max gain his ARIBA qualification in 1953, nearly 70 years ago, but Max gifted the collections library here in Portland Place, a large quantity of archival material. As you might know, this discussion follow follows the opening of the exhibition, Max Clendinning Interior Eulogies, curated by Simon Andrews at Sadie Cole's HQ in Berry Street. It's part of the London Design Festival and it's open until the 1st of October. So run, don't walk to St. James's, although whether that's impeded by current events, take your luck. Uh, with furniture, artworks, photographs and publications from private lenders, including pieces from, both, uh, from Max and Ralph's private home, the exhibition is a long-awaited sampler of their multi-tonal and multi-textured careers and life together. A little bit of a glimpse, but I'm encouraging you all to go down and see the show for yourself. I'm joined here tonight with Simon Andrews, as I say, who curated the exhibition, an internationally respected expert with over 30 years experience in the global market for design, previously senior international specialist for Christie's, Andrews has served on the authenticating committees for a number of international art and design fairs, has uh, sorry, has lectured widely and written extensively and is now the founder of Andrews Art Advisory Limited. Ben Kelly is one of the most influential designers in the UK. He is best known for his interior design of the legendary nightclub, the Hacienda in Manchester. His practice produced influential work for the Sex Pistols, Vivian Westwood, Malcolm McLaren, Factory Records, the Science Museum, the V&A, the Natural History Museum, just to name a few. Um, ben has been extensively awarded for exhibition design, record cover design, and interiors. He is a royal designer for industry and professor in interior design at Kingston University, and his work is held in the permanent collections of both the V&A and the British Council. Last but not least, Beth and Laura Wood. Bethan has run her eponymous and multidisciplinary practice since 2009, another Royal College of Art graduate. Her work is characterized by materials investigation, art artisan collaboration, passion for color and detail. Residencies and location-based projects are important to her design process, often working in response to the location or in collaboration with local manufacturers. As a collector herself, Bethan is fascinated by the connections we make with everyday objects that surround us. Among her many clients, she has produced works for Nilofar Gallery in Milan, 1882 Limited, Christopher Farr, Perrier Jouet, Rosenthal, Marissa Kvadrat, Sisi Tapi, <laughs> Hermes and Dior. Will that do? Okay. Um, with such a marvellous lineup, and also turn out tonight, thank you again for coming. I'm hoping many of you will know of Clendenning's work, though to help build the foundation, I wish to read a very short biography. Born in County Amar in Northern Ireland in 1924, Clendenning qualified as an architect in 1953. Earlier projects had included furniture and exhibition designs, including the uh, 1948 Britain Can Make It and the 1951 Festival of Britain exhibitions. Significant architectural commissions were to follow, including Manchester Oxford Road train station, which was completed in 1960 and is now grade two listed, and also the Crawley Civic Centre, which was done in 1964, which featured a boldly designed interior that soon attracted new commissions from influential London clients. Establishing his own studio in 1965, Clendinning focused on interior and furniture design, 
except for a limited furniture series that was briefly produced for retail in the latter half of the 1960s, most pieces were either one-offs or prototypes. These were often handmade together uh, with Ralph Adron and produced either for their own use or for the private clients that increasingly represented Clendinning's commissions from the 1970s onwards. <clears throat> Excuse me. During this period, commercial design projects included the celebrated all gray interior of the Christian Dior Boutique on Mount Street in 1972, and numerous shops undertaken during the redevelopment of Covent Garden, of which Clendenning's 1982 facade for Christina Smith's tea house currently remains intact. Restlessly active until his passing in 2020, only two years ago, Clendenning never stopped designing furniture and unfailingly continued to reimagine his own living spaces. Now, I've purposely chosen not to show images during, during that so that I didn't take up more time, but also I wanted to let Simon Andrews explain a bit more about the works. So, Simon, I'm going to pass you that with you. So, Simon. <clears throat> <laughs> Not so formal. Can you just explain a bit about, about how and why you came to first learn of Max Grindening and indeed Ralph Adrian's work? Well, I mean, the journey begins as it often does with um, chance discovery. And the, the book that you see on the screen here is a book that I've had since I was about 18 years old that was um, something I just discovered at, uh, whilst I was a student at school. Um, it's called the Decorative Art Yearbook. It's a periodical that was uh, issued every year, and it's generally a survey of the prevailing trends in design, architecture, interior design, product design, textile design, and so on. Uh, normally, these books are populated with, um, you know, glorious Danish furniture and white friars glass, but what struck me, obviously, is the cover of this one that features, celebrates the interior of Max and Ralph's house photographed in 1965. Now, um, this cabinet is breathtaking. It's striking. It's uh, a glorious red lacquer, almost like an 18th century chinoiserie cabinet, but rendered as a very modern uh, 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 totemic form. It's photographed in the home of Max and Ralph, and luckily, there's a great spread of images in the book that seduced me completely, um, gratefully printed in color, unlike most of the other photographs in this book. So we start with a few photographs of the interior, and what struck me is that it's quite clearly an early, 20th, uh, early 19th century building that retains a lot of its original moldings, um, and yet has been rendered with a variety of seductive, unexpected surface treatments. In this case, uh, the entrance hall with a black and white tile floor, red hessian curtains, silver-painted silver painted walls uh, with a sort of abstract relief decoration made from paint lids, I believe, on the bottom, um, a photograph of the rear of the house with a green painted atrium that leads into the uh, garden. And then on an upper floor, the living room that is a completely different change of pace with a pretty much white interior, uh, furniture that is designed and made by Max. Um, but what is fascinating about this is that the interior is pretty much monochromatic. So the lower floor, a variety of different colors and textures, but this is streamlined, sleek, confident, modern, exciting, youthful, and energetic. Next, a photograph of the dining room. Again, here you can see a lot of the period details intact. So the sash windows, mullion sash windows are intact. The early fireplace is still there. And you can see also a little bit of the molding to the top of the walls that separates towards the ceiling. What I like is that these elements are still intact. They haven't been removed. It's not the prevailing tendency to strip out all of these details, but rather to celebrate them. And they're offset with, again, Max's furniture here, a dining table, um, a set of four chairs, one, one of these you'll be able to see in the exhibition. And then again, the cabinet, um, which incidentally is now in the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum, but more on that later. And then um, another final photograph from this spread, again, a gilt William IV mirror, circa 1830, reflecting the interior, which was painted dark chocolate brown, uh, again with prototypes of Max's furniture, an artwork uh, by Ralph uh, reflected in the mirror. Again, this piece is also in the exhibition and then lower below a black and white photograph revealing the same scene. So this is exciting stuff. It's not the majority of the prevailing taste, which would have been imported furniture from Denmark uh, or the British designers that were still following a, a relatively modernist tradition. There's something rather thrilling about these interiors, 
and that triggered an interest that has culminated all these years later in the exhibition that we've now been able to host. So, as always, old books are great things and not to be overlooked. This was the next book that I discovered that was published in the late 1970s, and it's a collection of photographs of interiors by the photographer Tim Street Porter. Uh, the images date from the late 1960s to the late 1970s, and it's a fantastic survey of bohemian, interesting, fascinating interiors. This, again, is the same, uh, the same house, uh, number three, Orwin Road, that Max and Ralph had lived in since 1959. But here it's a very different interior. Gone are the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the elements that we saw in the previous photographs. And here instead we have an interior that is almost entirely white or shades of white or off-white or yellow. Um, very subtle changes to the palette of the elements here. The curtains are made out of um, uh, a, a, almost like a clear plastic, like a cellophane. And looming fantastically over the interior is a giant papier-mâché tulip lamp that was made by Ralph in 1965. Again, another object that I invite you to see, because for me it's one of the most iconic objects of my experience in that it, it, it delivers an element of fantasy to the, to the interior that is underlined by, the, um, by the, 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 the soft interactive experience of the furnishings. Here again, another photograph from the same interior, again the same sort of period, late 1960s, the tulip offering an ambient light, um, again offset with a, a, a ziggurat Art Deco style uh, screen painted in pastel colors, not terribly legible in this photograph, but again standing in relief to the wall, and again illuminated, uh, illuminated tables. So this is, th this is really not what you expect in interiors of the era. It, it's supremely exciting and challenging in a good way. Again, uh, another photograph of the same room, different elements of furniture. Um, what's important to note is that Max, together with Ralph, they really did, they really did explore new materials. So the furniture here is made from um, uh, almost like a, a, a wet look plastic, a synthetic, uh, a synthetic textile, very much inspired by the, the costumes of, let's say, Pierre Cardin or, or André Courage. And it's very easy for us now to acknowledge the availability of a myriad of different materials that designers or decorators or architects can use. But in the mid-1960s, it was very challenging to find these ingredients. Um, they were not necessarily widely available, um, but here celebrated and explored to, to relatively radical effect. And then finally, um, another really interesting interior. This is moving off into a completely different direction. It's the same room in the same house, no longer white. Here we have uh, a superb abstraction of a Claris cliff plate that's been interpreted and warped to brilliant effect by Ralph, painted as a mural, looming over um, a selection of unique furniture that was entirely upholstered in red carpet and red velvet. Um, so a completely different, a dif different sensation. This photograph dating from the very early 1970s. So just by experiencing these photographs, we recognize that there's something very interesting happening here, something very exciting, and that is ultimately why we're all here tonight. Indeed. Um, so quite the process you've been on since discovering that original studio yearbook, but what more specifically of the highlights and anecdotes of the more recent journey, perhaps, in preparing uh, for the exhibition? Well, it, it, it's all very nice for me to sort of ramble on about my reminiscences and seeing these wonderful photographs in books, but it needs to turn into something at some time. And um, it was many years later when I was working for Christie's, handling a variety of different objects from the 20th century, and the one thing I wanted to find, I could actually never find, and it was Max Clendening Furniture. And I wasn't alone, there were many of us uh, who'd also seen that book and those publications, and so Max's furniture was like something of a holy grail or a mythical quest or an ark that didn't seem to exist in availability. We could find everything but Max's furniture. And then one day, um, a fellow walked into Christie's. He was a retired army officer who invited me to lunch at the Army and Navy Club and said, I've got some furniture you might like. And it just so happened to be Max and Max's furniture. Most unexpected origin. You like to fantasize about where these things come from, but I would never have imagined that, that an army officer would have been probably the first and only client of Max's that I met at that time. Anyway, that was a wonderful engagement. It led to further uh, discoveries of Max's furniture. Um, but the real discovery was Max himself, 
who um, one day had walked into Christie's, this was about 2001 or 2002, had a pocket watch to be valued, noticed that I put one of his chairs on the cover of one of my catalogs and said, oh, who, who, who's in charge of this? And so I met Max that way. So it was wonderful. So all these elements begin to tumble into place and um, there I am meeting Max. So we um, remained in touch throughout and various other evolutions happened during that period, including the acquisition of the cabinet, uh, again, that we see in this, this image, by the Victoria and Albert Museum in 2012 for an exhibition on British design. More to come on that later. And um, there was also an exhibition at the Ulster Museum. And uh, finally, a very good publication by uh, a couple of very celebrated French critics um, on decorators of the 60s and 70s, of which Max was really one of the only two British decorators to be celebrated in that book. So finally, I felt that we turned the corner from a mythic entity into something that was beginning to become tangible. Um, but you've explained about how the scarcity of works coming through your hands and that of the printed material. Um, so what, what can you say about the legacy, perhaps, that, that Max has left? Um, you know, what, what remains? What's, what can we celebrate other than your exhibition? Well, that, that, that's an intriguing prospect. Le legacy is a curious word, and in a funny kind of a way, I feel that Max's legacy is almost a bit like a jigsaw puzzle with certain elements missing, and we know they exist, and they'll be tied together by anecdote and discovery. And what we're doing at the moment is part of that process to, to help tie these elements of the legacy together. And I think the first place to start is to go back to the beginning. And as you, as you correctly outlined, um, Max had an early training in architecture. He'd also had a, 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 a talent as a painter. Um, his experiences in some ways followed a fairly typical trajectory for a post-war British architect during Reconstruction with exposure to the Britain Can Make It exhibition of 1948, the Festival of Britain in 1951, for which he designed uh, a pavilion in Belfast that was the first to feature his uh, idiosyncratic cut-out plywood furniture. Um, but we move towards the late 1950s, really, to see two very important pieces of architecture. It's all very well creating wonderful interiors, but there is gravitas and there is earnestness and there is commitment and sincerity to his work. And we see this in the, 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 the uh, Manchester Oxford Road Railway Station, here photographed, that was commenced in the late 1950s, finished in 1960. Um, the first building in Britain to feature a timber roof over the uh, railway platforms, and again, interestingly, fitted out with a pretty interesting interior. And what I like about this is it's not really modernism. I mean, it looks like modernism, but it's moving, moving off into a slightly different direction. So you can see the pavilions in here. They've got slightly bulbous edges to the windows. There's a characteristic uh, horseshoe-shaped bench in the foreground. Timber paneling was used uh, on the wall that we see on the left here. Unexpected, it's, it's, not, it's not the usual ingredients that we expect to see in an interior of this type. Again, here you can see that laminated wood has been used for the structure. Laminated wood would become important subsequently for Max's furniture. And again, the distinctive shape, these sort of rounded squares uh, for, the, for the windows. Now, the other great building that sadly no longer exists, it was demolished a couple of years ago despite um, willingness to protect it. This was Crawley Civic Centre uh, in West Sussex. This is a very different style, almost Mayan-like in its temple-like form. Um, again, a different kind of modernism, but one that has a very distinct personality. And you'll notice on the far wall, there's a, a frieze in relief in which we begin to see some of the shapes that I begin, begin to recognize subsequently in Max's furniture. Sadly demolished, but this was an important building because the furniture design for it was what, Max dis what, what basically then led to the furniture production. Um, this is, there's very few images of the interior actually. Most of, all of them are held here in Reba. This one's interesting. Um, an entrance lobby, but notice the two almost bisecting semicircles here as a decorative element. Um, one's invited to think of Carlo Scarpa, um, but these ingredients I identify in Scarlo's, Scarpa's work a little bit later. Um, but Max was incredibly well, uh, he understood architecture, he understood design, was very well read, 
very well exposed to the architecture of Corbusier and I'm sure Scarpa, Domus magazine. Um, but it's sad that um, for someone that has created these two wonderful buildings, there is only simply Manchester Oxford Road that exists. I'm wary of time. Um, we need to move. I, think I will speak bit. even but, faster. But I can see the next image that you've prepared. Um, so perhaps you could speak about what remains What today. does remain, actually, and you can go and see it currently for the time being, but um, Max was very involved in the development of uh, Covent Garden, working with a developer uh, called Christina Smith. This is the tea house. Uh, Neil Street still exists. Distinctive characteristic lattice. Um, that remains, and long may it remain so. Right, so now we're back to the original exhibition promotional image that I think we'll see a few times this evening, apologies, but uh, can you maybe just touch on then, as we're at this point, uh, the exhibition and the route to it, and what visitors might be able to expect if they haven't already seen it? The, the exhibition is a great thing, and I'm absolutely delighted to Sadie and her team for um, putting this on and supporting me throughout it. I mean, in many ways, to produce an exhibition on Max is long overdue. Um, the idea with the exhibition was to simply create an environment that was suggestive of the world of Max and indeed Ralph. And very kindly, Ralph has loaned objects. We've been able to obtain objects from other sources. But it's an expression of the... I hope, the idea and the sensitivity. And we're intending to provoke ideas and to provoke dialogue because I think the most important thing that we can do as curators or as arbiters of objects and culture is to provoke dialogue and to encourage stimulation and to invite people to consider questions that they had not perhaps considered before. So really, it's an exploration. This is simply another stage in the process of exploration, but one that we're willing to celebrate and we invite organic evolution of this onwards and beyond. Well, I look forward to maybe coming back to the question of what next in the hope that this might prompt some, some points, but I can see there's one more image, so. Yeah, what next? We'll see what next. There will be something next. And I'll, I'll, I'm conscious of time. I'll close with a comment that, for me, I, I suppose encapsulates what we need to do. And that is on a recent trip to Manchester with friends who are actually fairly knowledgeable I was told, oh, you absolutely must go and see the railway station at Oxford Road. It's designed by a very important Danish architect. <laughs> to which I said, well, no, it's actually Max Clendening. And so we need to get the message out. This exhibition is a great opportunity to stimulate further dialogue. And on that point, I, um, I invite my other, my other friends and colleagues to develop the narrative further. Okay, well, thank you, Simon. Okay, so... Another wonderful picture. Uh, but I've invited Ben, um, and you know, obviously, sorry, start again. In the, in the British design, tradition and modernity after 1948, a book that Ben is referenced in, he acknowledges the influence of the bright colors and bold lines and the disposable aesthetics of Max Clendinning, uh, his designs, as well as, as well as Ralph Adrian's visualizations. This also appears on your Wikipedia page, so I'm guessing it's important then. Um, Does it? To that effect. Um, I've drawn together for you some images that are uh, held by the Victoria and Albert Museum and also here at the RIBA uh, that bring together uh, Max's vision and Ralph's drawings. Perhaps if I can invite you to speak about them. Sure. This um, image in particular, um, I was a student at Lancaster Art School in the mid to late 1960s and decided I wanted to do interior design. Um, never quite sure why, but uh, there, there, there wasn't much work that I could see that um, interested me at the time until I must have stumbled upon the magazine that published this drawing um, in 1968. The Daily Telegraph. The magazine. Daily Bloody Telegraph, I believe. I don't know what I, what I was doing looking at it, but um, uh, honestly, this image had a major impact on me. It, it, um, it excited me and it kind of inspired me. We've gone to the next one. That, that one too, I'd, I'd kind of never seen anything like these images and um, it really fired me up. 
and, and gave me some kind of hope that there was, there was another place to go to. I'd never seen anything like this before. Um, and I suppose also it, 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 it led me to figure out I had to, I had to go to London. Um, the work was done there and it seemed to me at the time, uh, amazing word, modern. Um, so we keep going. I, I somehow got to see all of these images and they, they just inspired me. I, I found them to be incredible and it, it just helped me on my road, on my journey. Um, Were these in the magazine, do you know? Yes. I mean, that one says... I can't Telegraph. Telegraph. Page 36. Okay. Lots of them. Um, and, and also, as you can see, they're signed uh, Ralph Adrian at the top. Yeah. Well, hopefully you can see them. You know, it's hard to kind of put into word why they were so inspirational to me, but I guess they were, they were new and unusual and, and different. And, you know, it seemed to me that Max was a kind of, um, what's that word I'm searching for? I've written it down. A maverick, you know, he, and, and that spoke to me. And, and obviously Ralph as well, because these drawings were actually by Ralph. Um, interpreting Max's ideas. So this kind of amazing kind of collaboration going on, which I've collaborated hugely through my work. So it's great to see that that's the collaboration. Keep going, please, Libby. So this, this one um, became really important to me. Years later, um, we were invited by the V&A to design the exhibition British Design 1948 to... 2012. 2012, which kind of pretty much covered my life. Um, and the curator uh, putting the show together said, we have to recreate a corner of Max and Ralph's room. So consequently, I was taken to visit Max and Ralph at the house. And it was like, you know, going to, I don't know, the, the, it was just amazing to be able to do that. And I, I couldn't believe that having been inspired by the work to be actually asked to kind of rebuild some of it. So... Uh, so, and hey presto. That, that's what was put into the v &A show. And I remember distinctly Ralph's, um, what's the right word? Um, keenness that we get the colors right, um, um, big time. Which, you know, it, and because he was so determined that we should get it right, and, and, and quite rightly so. But it, it, was, it was just a privilege to do that and to, to go to the house. Um, um, somebody had made the comment earlier that the first image we had is the holding image um, of Max reclining on a white settee, looked a bit like Peter Saville. Um, so never I think heard, there's quite a lot of, of which... Never heard of Peter Saville? <laughs> We may have designed his apartment, um, and it, I don't know, there's quite a lot of synergy there, that even if you weren't aware of exactly where it was coming from, you were drawing down on, on very similar Whoa. references. Whoa. Yeah. Um, um, but there's that Spooky. Spook well, it's, very, it's all spooky stuff, because you don't really know where, where things are coming from, and um, they get stored up, and they kind of seem to find their way out later on, which we'll see in a bit. Um, well, shall we move to that? But okay. actually, I, I'm curious, though, you were saying about um, you, you, couldn't put, you can't put it into words as to what actually um, led you to it. And I, it, yet you mentioned the words interior and modern, mm. which mm. at that time well, perhaps were not, not so, no. you know, in the late 60s. If well, we're not... well, well, also, uh, you know, I was at this art school in, in Lancaster doing a very weird interior design course. It wasn't nationally recognised. And um, I thought, well, I know David Hockney went to the Royal College and Hockney was from Bradford and I, I applied to go to Bradford Art School and they turned me down. Um, so this whole thing about the Royal College in London and all of that and... But you have to remember, I guess, you know, putting it into context, if you think about how R Ralph and Max were so much part of the counterculture of that time, well, you know, yeah. UFO Club, Kubrick, um, 
you know, Antonio, and, yeah, and but, then you're the next generation with the Sex Pistols and and the sex shop in. in but the, the the white the white room with the squidgy sausage. Um, well, it predated White Cube, didn't it? Um, never seen anything like that before when, when I saw that image at the time. And, and so they were kind of like banners flying up of encouragement, you know, that there's... The only other work that I saw at the time was work by the Italians, you know, by Super Studio and... Um, Archizoom. et al. So, but to see it in London, in somebody's house, uh, and, and in the Telegraph, um, but, but, and but, it, it, it said, go to London, young man, go to bloody London. So to go to Royal College, um, where there was an interior, a postgraduate interior design course, I was kind of disappointed there because I couldn't see around me the kind of stuff that I was looking for, but it's still, um, Max's work was, was still, you know, encouraging me to, to keep doing stuff. And, and these, these synergies continue to happen in uh, preparing okay. for this, well, this, this is, talk. This is a really weird We've discovered one. another one. I, so this is, this is uh, yeah. Simon, you'll have to correct me on the date. What this is, or Ralph? 1965. 1965, painting by Ralph Adron. Which I had never seen. Okay. Ben, tell us about this piece. S so the first four colours on the left... Oh, we can't go back. I can go back. Ah. Um, this is Ben Kelly, 2022. I'm completely unaware. Amazing. And then, ta -da! <laughs> Just in case, to, to give it a great plug. But, I mean, those sorts of synergies, I think... Oh, happen. Ralph, thank you very much. <laughs> Merry <Okay>. Christmas. <laughs> Okay, yeah. what another fantastic photograph. So now I turn to Bethan. Um, when Simon was thinking of speakers for tonight's talk, and specifically for, uh, next generation practitioners, whom he felt would be simpatico with Max and Ralph, his mind went immediately to Bethan. Um, so Bethan, I want to ask you, starting away, by saying, were you aware of Max's work prior to this crazy and magical journey that we've all been? <coughs> and even if not, Perhaps you can share some of your perceptions and impressions from, from the discovery or, or rediscovery. So, again, another feeling of that faith is storing us together. Uh, much earlier in this year, I was, I do frequent flea markets and vintage fairs and purely for research purposes. And then um, there was one of these chairs, yeah, sorry, I was there, um, that uh, was in this fair, and I didn't know Max's work very well or hardly at all, but I saw this chair and thought it was amazing. It had sold before I'd got there, so I wasn't able to um, put my claws into it. But it started um, this interest of, that I had to understand who made this amazing chair and the world he was uh, from. And then later this year, I was invited to... Um, uh, by Simon to come and experience the world of Max and Ralph and um, it's been um, an amazing pleasure to just to start get to get a taste of this um, amazing universe and um, I picked this image just as a start because it also makes um, another connection through I'm also not from London I'm from the Midlands and I I spent many years from home looking through magazines in the Terence Conrad house book and Golden Homes, which my mum had, and I would learn how to do 1960s sewing patterns. And I dreamt of being able to paint my bedroom walls in this kind of um, style and, and amazing craziness. So um, it now feels that part of what drew me to London has now come full circle into being uh, invited back into the same home, but experiencing the interior that um, Ralph and Max has, have created in its most recent form. So that's mainly the um, images I'm going to show and just a few things that kind of sparked my joy and then um, cross-pollinated with things I've been doing recently. So um, this is my first image of, of going into the looking glass of um, this wonderful world that combines uh, Max and Ralph's universes and this love of pattern on pattern and um, 
detailing. And for me, details are what build up my work and how I understand things best. So the small details in the house is what kind of blew my mind. So this is one of many corners that I started to photograph in the space. And I'm, I slowly started to digest the universe through um, these kind of uh, corners. So this is in the hallway. And um, I love that it's um, a very kind of British um, architecturally kind of Victorian style house that I know well, um, but with the um, amazing universe that Max and Ralph have put in it. And, um, and so you go from a corner like that to a corner like this, which is in uh, one, of the, one of the chairs that's actually in the exhibition. And I just love how this detailing of the corner is also part of the language that allows this sofa to be built using the same cushions uh, dimensions for each section and that shunt forward that that intersection of the corner gives you, allows you for the same cushion shape. And it's, it's, it's kind of the mecca of being both simple but also very um, interesting aesthetically and graphically and all those things combined together. So that then goes into this, which is another detail from the house, I think, that wrapped on the fireplace, which again, um, I love, I also have a deep love for uh, faux materials and uh, terrazzos and paintings of terrazzos. So this is another little detail from the house. And then we go to another detail. This is the one of uh, the other sofas in a room upstairs. And again, for me, it's this mixing of, of small details or intersections in the form with, with a kind of proportional scale, which I think is really beautiful within Max's work, that it's, it, it is what you kind of imagine of the kind of um, the space bubble, but then not quite because these other interjections, these other changes in proportion that keep it moving. And so that's what I, I find very joyous. And then even in this, it's the movement of the down, built into the um, design of the piece. So another corner detail. And then this is when you zoom out in the room. And um, as I slowly went around the house and, and I was a little bit overwhelmed by how amazing it was and also to hear lovely stories from Ralph. I didn't take that many pictures, but what I did start to notice everywhere was the zigzagging detail that covers both through uh, the flat artwork and also all the furniture. And once you start seeing it, you can't stop seeing it everywhere. And then into the hallway, into the kitchen, and even in the mobiles. And for me, that's the key, these small details that kind of signify their world, where, then, where they can take something like the mobile that most of us associate with Calder and as a particular aesthetic that's, as a designer, you can, it's always very hard to like find the right way between being inspired by something that's so magical, like a Calder, for example, but also then be able to make an interpretation that's your own. So this ability just to put those like little notches in that signify, well, signified to me their universe was something that I just was um, got very excited by. I also liked, as you go through the house, there's also quite a lot of success in Memphis um, um, objects because this is uh, something that I, I have a passion for and they had a passion for. And most of the proportions of things from the Memphis and the success, it's, it's, it's very bulky. And in, I'm, I work a lot in Italy, so I normally always see it in the proportions of those environments. So to see it transformed within their environment in the scale of um, a British domestic home, I felt was so exciting. And it, it made me see those objects with new eyes. And then the last detail that I'll talk about um, comes from... Um, this um, um, uh, wall cabinet, which also for me started um, to cross over into the, the universe of the aesthetic movement and um, uh, William Morris and William de Morgan, which I know is a, a, a passion of uh, Ralph. And, and, and coincidentally, within the last two years when I was doing my own uh, solo show um, for the gallery I worked with in Milan, I had been... Um, starting to work and reference from this particular period of uh, design because it has a very strong crossover to, to the British aesthetic. So I loved this. And if we go to the next picture, you can see this 
in context then with like the amazing painted um, wiggle world of Ralph interpreting uh, the William de Morgan and the Morris. And, I, and it's for me this combination between this kind of this 60s space aesthetic meets this universe that also I connect to from like my parents' home and going to stately homes as a child and being in Middle England just made me so happy. And I, the the bulb twigged why Simon was like, Bethan, I think you're gonna, I think you're gonna like this and you should come and meet Ralph. Um, so this is one of my pieces that I did from uh, my latest show, which for, for me comes from some of the references that I was seeing in the house. And um, so this is a bed head that I uh, designed with my version of the Wiggle universe. And then um, these are from a series of cabinets that um, started off as a handle project because I was really interested in the, how to design or make a series of um, handles for furniture. And I like my handles that I did very much and I felt I had a good balance. Um, so those are the two handles. But then when I went around the house, I then got to experience the master of Max's handles, which did all the things that I wanted to do, but even simpler than I could imagine. And for me, it's that eye of detail that both of them have to create form and pattern that um, just blows my mind. And then even going to the show, um, which I will recommend you do, um, I found the next detail that I'm in love with, which is the red button. So I, uh, I, I had to get a good picture of that and then claim my space and, uh, and relax in the beautiful world of uh, Max and Ralph. And we, we take it back to Max, as always, at the end, as this whole talk seems to be going just in circles. Do, do we have time for questions? Do Can I... I just make an observation yes. that I think it was 43 years between me seeing Ralph's drawings in the Telegraph and Beth Ann going to the house and being inspired by that. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Um, I feel I've done a, a lot of talking, as have um, my fellow guest speakers, but if you, anybody has a question... Ah, maybe we should do it to microphone. Can I? Can you tell us something about uh, the upbringing of Max and Ralph? You both spoke about looking up to what was available, the possibilities of other places. Did they have a similar experience of any kind? Mm. Uh, well, in terms of um, Max's upbringing, he was brought up in Rush Hill in Northern Ireland and um, from a very early age illustrated a talent for painting, um, was supported in this interest by two former Royal College of Art uh, painters who encouraged him to, to explore that. Began to um, move into architecture almost by default because his talent was recognized by one of his tutors. And um, that became the, the path, really, that seemed to sort of illustrate the best fit. That said, um, although that became his practice, I would say that Max remained active across every single medium imaginable. And um, although he created buildings, he also created interiors, he created furniture, but he continued to paint, to draw, to sketch, to scribble, always with ideas, um, always making sculptures. I mean, if you were to visit the home, uh, there's sculptures that are made in the 1940s and sculptures made right up until Max's last days. So I think he was a creative spirit that had the good fortune to have the right guidance and support at the right time that allowed him to, to flourish. And Ralph, if, I, if you don't mind me saying, but you also had the good fortune to have a tutor who recognized your abilities that led you to be accepted at Croydon School of Art, um, where you, well, your tutor, as I understand it, he, he understood your, your skills and recommended that you explore theater design and stage and set design, leading subsequently to um, to an education at the Slade School of Art, and then that obviously leading into um, uh, your work as a theatre stage and set designer and painter and illustrator, an all-round creative spirit. So I think in both cases, um, perhaps 
similar opportunities to the two of you in that you were not necessarily certain in your destiny, but you knew you wanted to do something, and you knew you had the talent to do something and the urge to explore. And through serendipity and good fortune and chance encounter, those things were able to happen, and you were able to flourish. So really, I think that's, that's the compatibility, the similarity. It's the good fortune for people with talent to discover opportunity and encouragement. Nicely answered. I'm going to race down, because I want this to be recorded. Thank you. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, I just had a quick question. Are there any plans to reissue any of Max's furniture, perhaps with you know, something like hay or vitra um, in the future? Um, I mean, I, I, I don't really think so. Um, I mean, I think, in a way, these are precious objects that are all the more precious for their scarcity and rarity. Um, I don't think I would imagine a world where there were multiple examples of any of these objects. That said, um, they are special and they do deserve a wider audience. And so we would remain open-minded for certain objects to be able to consider with the right approval um, their production to exacting standards in a certain limited capacity. But in terms of a deal with Vitra and suddenly saying, legions of three-legged chairs in a restaurant, then I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's the direction that, that any of us would feel favorable. My leg. Well, okay, I think we can uh, safely conclude that the, the Clendinning circle will carry on, hopefully with uh, more inspired thoughts and ideas and conversation past tonight. Sorry, Ben. I just think it's important to say what an amazing job Simon and Sadie's team have done to host the exhibition. It's long overdue and I think really very important there's nothing quite like the work. It, it's totally unique. Um, so I just want to say bravo, well done. Bravo. Okay. On that very lovely note, can I ask you all to thank my, my uh, fellow panellists and yourself for joining us.